Ambassador Azimov has been, in, in the three years that I served in Baku, and I think my predecessors would share this sentiment, uh, a patriot who has represented his country well and effectively uh, and has been a friend to many of us uh, in the room. Um, our format today is relatively simple. Uh, Ambassador Azimov will, uh, will make some remarks. I hope, looking back a little bit uh, on, uh, on the last 20 years, on this anniversary of Azerbaijan's independence. Uh, give us Azerbaijan's perspective on some of the critical issues that face it and face the region. Uh, and talk specifically about uh, some of the matters in U.S.-Azerbaijan relations. Uh, our ambassador to uh, Baku, unfortunately, will be returning to Washington, I assume, uh, in the coming several days. And that's not a positive development in U.S.-Azerbaijan relations. There, there I, I, are, I certainly hope, some other, uh, uh, some other more positive matters also to talk about uh, and update us a little bit on the, uh, on the status of the negotiations over, uh, over Karabakh and on other matters on your agenda. That should leave plenty of time uh, for, uh, for questions, so please be thinking of what you would like to ask. Ambassador Zimov. Well, thank you. Thank you, first of all. It, it's too loud, probably. Huh? Thank you for uh, these uh, uh, warm introduction and uh, Welcome remarks, uh, Ross. It's a pleasure to, to see you and uh, other old friends from Baku. It's a pleasure to be in Washington back again and uh, being a, a guest of, uh, of your institution. Uh, it seems to me that you gave me uh, a mission impossible to implement <laughs> in terms of speaking about all 20 years of independence in somewhat 15 minutes and still to l leave you plenty of time for questions. Uh, but still, I would uh, uh, dwell on certain several issues. Uh, first, uh, 20 years of, of uh, last 20 years of the history of Azerbaijan were, of course, part of my life as well. I joined the ministry in 1989, and uh, I was quite fortunate in being involved in all this, although troublesome and very difficult issues. But then after all, important, and uh, some of them successfully dealt with. So I'm uh, uh, looking back to these 20 years with a sense of satisfaction. Uh, at the same time, I understand that there are some difficult issues yet to, to be solved and remaining on the table. But those are not uh, of, a kind which, uh, of a kind of issues which you cannot deal with. Those issues are not. Uh, uh, impossible for, for Azerbaijan, and uh, I hope that we shall uh, overcome them. I hope that, I'm sure that we shall solve them. Probably 20, 20 years in uh, these two decades uh, took Azerbaijan through many challenges, including, first of all, finding its own priorities, its own national interests, formulating its foreign policy, and going, uh, taking this challenge of uh, identifying the directions of where to go and what to do. In the beginning of 1990s, in 91, uh, where this uh, process started through recognition of Azerbaijan by many countries, including United States, and uh, working with uh, newly assigned ambassadors to Baku, we are trying to identify the priorities. And I think priority of Azerbaijan for that time was, first of all, uh, to uh, change uh, the dimension of the region and to uh, use the historical opportunity which was given by uh, the chance of collapse of Soviet Union and to use this historical opportunity effectively because we have had such a chance in the beginning of 20th century. Uh, we missed that opportunity not because of our ineffectiveness but because of uh, outside pressures. So this time Azerbaijan A is successful, B process which we have uh, conducted and we have carried out through has become irreversible and see we think that perspectives that Azerbaijan has are bright. At the same time there are many challenges and uh, challenges on the table are still still demanding the attention not only of Azerbaijan but of uh, our close partners among which I think United States occupies the most important way. So. That's why I'm trying once per year at least uh, to come to Washington and uh, to discuss the ways 
how are we going to cooperate and how are we going to find the solutions to those outstanding issues. Uh, the last uh, accomplishment, last achievement of Azerbaijan's foreign policy, uh, which in a way marked 20th anniversary of Azerbaijan, and that was an election of Azerbaijan to United Nations Security Council, has been specific purpose which brought me this time to Washington. Our membership to UNSC as uh, elected member for two years, uh, representing the Eastern European group there, is uh, an important opportunity. The matter is that two years are very short time in terms of uh, normal activity. Uh, and uh, you have to use this two years in a most effective way, A, and B, in a way to have outcomes and implications and continued perspectives after these two years. Uh, on the other hand, the agenda of UNSC is uh, rather challenging and in many ways coming closer to Azerbaijan's neighborhood, uh, coming uh, in a way touching Azerbaijan's interests, and therefore consultations which I had yesterday and will continue today with my colleagues in State Department and uh, other institutions are very important because we try to find those uh, common grounds uh, for uh, coordination and cooperation between two countries. The uh, United States has uh, a different uh, a scale of uh, interest, of course, as, as a global power and as a P5 member. Uh, at the same time, the United States is very close and attentive to the issues of the neighborhoods of Azerbaijan. In, in a way, UNSC issues uh, are coming across the agenda of regional dimension. And in terms of regional dimension, there are certain threats of proliferation or uh, terrorism or illegal activities or drug trafficking, uh, crisis in, in some neighboring countries. In some countries, we have peacekeeping operations. In some forces are going to be withdrawn very soon. So all these issues are coming at the table of UNSC in a time when Azerbaijan becomes a member. At the same time, you know that Azerbaijan is a member of Islamic uh, organization, Islamic cooperation organization, and uh, being one of the most advanced uh, and moderate Islamic countries, Azerbaijan has a nice opportunity in providing a bridge between the United States and Islamic world in giving more understanding to the positions of Islamic countries on one hand and trying to enrich the opportunities of cooperation uh, in dealing with the issues on the, of, on the agenda of UNSC. So in some cases, I think Azerbaijan represents quite a useful partner, in some cases, unavoidable partner for the United States. Uh, through these 20 years, of course, uh, speaking about accomplishments and achievements, I cannot avoid the issue of energy and uh, energy uh, uh, being part of foreign policy as well as national policy as well as factor of economic development of Azerbaijan and some other countries in the region represents both a set of opportunities at the same time uh, being uh, subjected to certain challenges. And uh, you know that uh, we have managed to, in your time and uh, in time of your predecessors, we have managed to, uh, to do a lot in, in taking, first of all, uh, East and Western orientation for, uh, for the transportation of uh, energy uh, resources of the Azerbaijani national sector in the Caspian Sea, uh, taking that very difficult, at the same time, strategic decision, Azerbaijan has paid a heavy price for that. Uh, you remember the events in 1994, the sequence of events uh, in 1994, which was marked in, in the end of that in September 20th uh, with the signing of oil contract called Contract of the Century. But more difficult decisions were yet to be taken. Uh, decisions on the transportation of those resources, and that was most important in, because it's one part of a deal to ex uh, exploit resources, and uh, the greater deal uh, is to provide its transit. And I think, in general, uh, the decision uh, which has been taken by Azerbaijan, an ir irreversible decision, uh, on integration of east to west, 
on connection between Azerbaijan and Europe, on transit of energy resources of Azerbaijan to European markets, on integration of Azerbaijan into your Atlantic institutions. All these decisions are interconnected. All these decisions come together in one consolidated concept of Azerbaijan's foreign policy. Well, we have been challenged, as I said. In 1994, uh, we have been uh, uh, compelled by a situation developing on the ground in the conflict zone to uh, conclude, to take a decision on ceasefire, uh, and uh, to follow up with negotiations, which unfortunately go further on and on still with, uh, without any result. And uh, probably here we have another anniversary, which would be rather sad uh, to be marked in, on 24th of March of uh, 2012, 20th anniversary of the Minsk process, with uh, ambassadors coming in and out, with negotiations changing places, with uh, uh, maybe uh, different formats being used, and uh, with different phraseology covering actually lack of success so far. This is the biggest trouble of, uh, of this process. What should be done, or what could be done? Uh, do we have a resource for that? Well, certainly after events of August 2008, uh, when Georgia's territories were occupied. Uh, this event has changed the paradigm of, uh, of, uh, uh, of presences and of interests and connections in the region of the South Caucasus. Some Western countries uh, thought that the issue is done and the South Caucasus is off the agenda. Some are feeling fatigue of this and uh, try to take a more neutral or, let's say, uh, hesitant position, ignoring position. Uh, coming to US, I usually try to draw the attention of Washington to the matter of fact that this conflict is not a conflict which would stop development of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's development is irreversible. Sovereignty is irreversible. Independence is an achievement which will be defended. At the same time, uh, territorial integrity matters. And of course, the government of Azerbaijan, under whatever circumstances, would consider as a priority the restoration of the territorial integrity of, of the country. Uh, we have given our formulas, we have given our proposals, we have uh, participated in all rounds of negotiations, and we are going to continue that. Uh, although we have a sad feeling of uh, ineffectiveness of these approaches, uh, we don't think that uh, now the uh, attendance of United States to this Minsk group and to the Minsk activities is adequate to the situation. Since August 2008, it has been more uh, declining from taking active stance on the issues. Some trends in general, Euro-Atlantic context and OCE context, make me feeling uh, even more frustrated. With Astana summit declaration of December 2010, we learned something new about OCE geography. Now there is, uh, despite we are used to know since 1975 and since 90 two when we joined OCE, or that time CSCE was the term, uh, we have been uh, committed to this position of invisibility of OCE area from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Nowadays we learn that there are Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian parts of OCE area within which Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian institutions security-related institutions will cooperate using OOC as a framework. That makes me concerned. That makes me uh, kind of uh, uh, thrown back into reminiscences of, of the past with bipolar system of NATO and Warsaw Pact, now Warsaw Pact to be replaced by CSTO. For a country like uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, I see my friend Taymur here, uh, for Ukraine, probably, or others, who have no 
uh, for the time being, no reason to consider a realistic opportunity of a membership in your Atlantic community, and on the other hand, having a strong reason uh, to exclude any possibility to in membership for to CSTO, like Collective Security Treaty Organization. Uh, this uh, status of affairs becomes becomes quite uh, vacuum-like. Uh, it creates a feeling of uh, of isolation or non-alliance. So, aren't we non-aligned members of European Community? Shouldn't we think about a new status? Shouldn't we elaborate a new pattern of cooperation between your Atlantic Community, let's say, and? Azerbaijan or Georgia. While memberships are not possible, and August 2008 proved this, uh, while at the same time uh, CSTO is not liked and, uh, let's say, is not welcomed, uh, at least because of the fact that one of the members of CSTO occupies 20% of territories of Azerbaijan or either of Georgia, um, we cannot consider that as an opportunity. Therefore, uh, looking into possible uh, ways of dealing with this issue, looking into uh, possibilities of providing some kind of security commitments, some kind of security assurances, uh, shouldn't we think about new pattern of relationship between a country and NATO as a Euro-Atlantic community, as a Euro-Atlantic Union collective defense organization? I wouldn't say that uh, that should immediately involve the Article 5 of Washington Treaty. I'm not that naive. At the same time, I think that both sides, NATO and Azerbaijan, may have uh, mutually needed, mutually demanded uh, assets which can reciprocate and which can compensate and contribute into interests of each other, be it fighting terrorism, providing transit, uh, fighting organized crime, helping countries in providing border controls, fighting drug trafficking, mm, let's say participating in peacekeeping operations elsewhere. This is something which should be considered urgently because uh, otherwise uh, the situation in the region would be imbalanced or would be uh, taken out of uh, at least currently visible balance of interest. Uh, on the other hand, you ask me to elaborate on uh, a bit on the Minsk process, and I think what we observe in OSCE and what I shortly uh, have uh, described to you is, uh, is having its repercussions in the Minsk process as well. For Azerbaijan, it always has been important to have uh, OSCE as a major organization, umbrella organization for settlement of the, the conflict. A, because OSC is multinational organization, European values and principles based organization. Helsinki Final Act is an important pillar element of, of this institution. B, OSC is based on consensus and therefore small nations are guaranteed there uh, against any decision to be taken uh, out of context of their interests. Uh, C, uh, we have always have been in favor of developing certain capacities in OC for dealing with these issues. Minsk Group, as an institution composed of somewhat 11, 12 countries, is quite suitable, is quite fitting format for taking process of negotiations forward. But I would say that from my point of view, the process of negotiations has been subjected on one hand to uh, geopolitical competition of some major players in the Minsk group, keeping other important players, regional players, European players, outside of the game. Uh, second, uh, Minsk group has been subjected to different influences of, uh, of side events, let's say, of side processes going on. And uh, probably uh, Minsk Group uh, has uh, been driven 
in a direction of neglection of, first of all, major pillar uh, or founding principles of negotiations. Negotiations cannot be based on a fait accompli. Negotiations cannot be uh, conducted by a logic of twisting arms of the other side. A necessary education is to be made. Principles have to be introduced and followed up by, observed by, first of all, by mediators. On the other hand, I'm uh, dissatisfied with the current trend in OCE, where since 92, my first summit in OCE, CSE that time, for, for me was important because we had, uh, with John Comblum, your ambassador to CSE that time, we have paid many efforts in, and we got uh, a desired result in creating a capacity of CSE for peacekeeping and for crisis management and for conflict resolution. In a way, I'm, re I'm coming to Washington from Vilnius uh, on 5th, 6th December. We have had Vilnius Ministerial COCE meeting where we tried a lot to uh, retain back these elements of 1992. We tried a lot to explain countries that peacekeeping of CSOCE is an important tool to be practically used and maybe in the most immediate future, in a day X when a conclusion of agreement would take place. Countries, parties to the conflict, will need this guarantee that uh, disengagement will be done, that forces, peacekeeping force will be in place, that parties which have zero trust uh, level uh, relationship uh, would be uh, comfortable in taking withdrawals from occupied positions. Uh, and uh, the role of CSE peacekeeping, OEC peacekeeping is tremendous there. But I've spent a lot of efforts in getting these formulas back again restored in the text. We did it in a way in Vilnius, but I think it's not a, an end of game. I think my opponents in OCE uh, would, would continue that. But let's say if they succeed and I fail and we lose OCE peacekeeping, what would be a substitute for that? Uh, what kind of tool you would suggest to me? While NATO is not able to come to the South Caucasus and CSTO is not desired by us and would not be acceptable uh, for the reasons I explained, uh, they are not in our eyes unbiased, impartial, multinational, peacekeeping prepared and standard trained force. Uh, it's a usual force of one country which is being used for certain purposes, politically motivated and covered by a peacekeeping uh, mandate. There are many issues which we could discuss in, in terms of UNSC as well, but the major issue is who remains on the market in providing these tools. And would that be, wouldn't that be subjected then to a continued geopolitical dispute over the mastership in the South Caucasus where Karabakh conflict is being used as a plot star now. It's, a not, it's not a big deal, the issue of a small part of population, now something like 30,000 people. It's not a deal uh, of, uh, of uh, separation. Separation here simply is not possible and uh, within the international law such a concept would be considered as ridiculous. The deal is about, the issue is about uh, the strategy of the South Caucasus with certain situations taking place after August 2008, with certain uh, deployments, with certain prolongations and extensions of mandates, etc. I think uh, uh, we have only Azerbaijan as a remaining island of predictable and reliable Euro-Atlantic partnership and Eastern Western energy transit uh, opportunities. So this is, in a nutshell, I spoke for some 25 minutes. I have to leave at 10.15, so we have plenty of time for your questions. All right, thank Please. you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, that very interesting and helpful um, 
helpful overview. Let me take the moderator's prerogative of asking a, a, a first set of questions, and I want to really uh, 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 key off of the last topic that you spoke about, the Karabakh negotiations. First question, um, a, an a, Azerbaijani scholar that I heard speak uh, recently uh, at a conference here characterized President Haydar Aliyev's strategy uh, after taking office uh, in the early 1990s as, as one of setting priorities. And that, and that in this individual's analysis, he gave really the priority to Azerbaijan's energy development uh, and its, connect, its energy connections with the West, and it, at, at least implicitly um, gave the Karabakh issue uh, a second standing as, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a priority to resolve uh, one way or another uh, for Azerbaijan for a certain period of time. So I'd, I'd ask, do you agree with that? Is there anything you'd like to uh, add to what you said earlier? Second, as you noted, uh, the, the Minsk Group negotiations, negotiations over the Karabakh conflict have dragged on and on and on. And you and I discussed this uh, many times when I was serving there. When I arrived in Azerbaijan in 2000, uh, in 2000, this was still sort of a relatively fresh conflict. The negotiations had only been going on for uh, eight, I guess, for eight years or so at that point. It seemed, uh, it, it, uh, we, had an, we had an attitude in the United States government, certainly, and, and I think this was shared in both Baku and in Yerevan, um, that, that, that things were going to get resolved that this was going to achieve some breakthrough. 20 years on, that seems a lot less obvious. Um, and, and so I, I, my second question is, um, uh, is, there, is, is Azerbaijan looking at or should Azerbaijan consider a change of strategy um, on the Karabakh issue? And if so, what, what might that be a, a strategy to, to, to try to get out of this endless stalemate that serves, realistically, serves neither the interests of Azerbaijan or of Armenia? Well, <clears throat> uh, in order to answer your first question, uh, I agree with the last conclusion, but I disagree with the reasonability behind. Uh, and in order to explain the reasons of disagreement, I would just refer you to those events of 994. Uh, probably beginning with 93, when in October, the last portion of territories of Azerbaijan in this area, uh, composing uh, almost 20%, have been occupied. During a visit of Margaret Afuglis, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, in her capacity as chief uh, chairman uh, in office of uh, uh, CSCE in Baku and the region that time. Well, President Aliyev, uh, being uh, one of mm, probably uh, most eminent statesmen in the history of uh, not only Azerbaijan, he would, of course, uh, consider that time uh, with a sense of responsibility First of all, the necessity of uh, restoring territorial integrity, and therefore, some efforts have been undertaken, caused by his predecessors, by the way. But he was continuing these efforts until uh, May 1994. So I wouldn't uh, simply uh, reject or uh, falsify the history, saying that uh, Haydar Aliyev, uh, once he came to power in Azerbaijan back again, in uh, 1993, he immediately changed the strategy. No, uh, there were military activities, there were efforts aimed at restoring territorial integrity, and Haider Aliyev could not do otherwise. It was a most immediate, expected reaction. Although he came in a different starting positions, army was uh, weak and uh, uh, he, with all his abilities of, of a manager, of an organizer, of a mobilizer, was trying in a short period of time to beef up some portions, some, uh, some uh, segments, some people, arrange some 
experts and uh, arrange some command structures uh, providing certainly uh, some uh, support to, uh, to those uh, people uh, through political efforts, but also looking for financial resources, etc. So he was very limited and constrained in terms of resources, and he was working on a huge time pressure. Uh, that was going on until, until spring of 94, when, at the same time, he took a decision, and a very firm, at the same time, difficult decision. I have been in this of in his office uh, during that night when uh, he decided to go tomorrow to Brussels to join PFP Partnership for Peace program and to sign there a framework document in the headquarters of NATO and to meet with NAC to speak at North Atlantic Council. That was a decision confronted by some. And until midnight, he was receiving calls urging him not to do that. He did not change because he never changed his decisions once taken. He, you, he would take time to work on a decision. But decision taken by him, I think, obviously uh, was someone, something he was convinced in. And therefore, he was following that. The decision taken by uh, the president to join PFP uh, was implemented on 4th of May. Immediately after 4th of May, the uh, situation in the conflict zone deteriorated as much as uh, on 12th of May, uh, President Aliyev took decision to declare a ceasefire. I wouldn't dwell on the reasons, you may elaborate yourself. But then on 20th of September, he signed the biggest and uh, in most important, strategically important energy contract, oil contract of the century. So this is a sequence of events. This sequence could not be changed. This is how the things work in this region. Uh, this demonstrates connections between security orientations, energy policies, and conflict connections to all this. This demonstrates that the arguments of the opposite side, that there is issue of uh, defendants of human rights or whatever right for self-determination are false. The major nature of that conflict is geopolitical and the Armenians are being used or they allow them to be used by someone uh, to, uh, to get their own smaller portion of interests in a larger fabric of geopolitics where they usually skillfully, as their history shows, skillfully tweak in these elements into this fabric, the smaller interests into larger fabric of geopolitics. This is how it worked, at least to, due to my knowledge. On, on your second question, um, could you remind of Change of strategy. Well, change of strategy. Uh, we actually are based on international law. We do not see any opportunity to change a position which is based and proceeds immediately from the principles of international law, uh, which are based on recognition of territorial integrity and a readiness of Azerbaijan to provide self-rule for both communities of a Karabakh region, Armenian community and Azerbaijani community. At the same time, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that while and until Armenia recognizes Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, naturally Azerbaijan will uh, stand on the same position. So this is, uh, this is fire backing or backfiring Armenia as well. They, they should be uh, quite uh, cognizant of that. Uh, on the side of strategy, uh, should we change our approaches in how implementing the position of Azerbaijan? Well, we, uh, we follow the advice of international community in this case. We have been uh, truly members of the Minsk Group under the mandate of OSCE, confirmed by UNSC resolutions of 1993. This is the hierarchy for us. And I don't see any reason to reconsider or to change the structure. 
The matter is how countries use this structure, how they behave. The Minsk group itself is not a problem. The Minsk group itself is very good format. I remember how Georgia was trying to establish an institution which would be multinational. You had in a time, you remember better than me, uh, a group of friends, uh, Taimur, friends of Secretary General, and Dieter Borden uh, from Germany was working there, providing you with a good piece of paper on allocation of uh, some uh, competences of power between Sukumi and Tbilisi. What happened with that paper? Paper was good, it was not bad. But what happened with that? Uh, where are they today? I know also that our Moldovan friends, I don't know anyone here is from Moldova, but our Moldovan friends are taking huge efforts uh, to maintain this international format for negotiations. We do have it. No reason to change. On the other hand, the Minsk group itself is being squeezed, downsized, on purpose and deliberately by three co-chairmen who would, would act as chef in the kitchen, keeping all guests out and uh, letting them in only when the cook is ready and uh, the dish is on the table, uh, in a way, informing them of what do they think. Yesterday I read the piece, a piece of Bernard Fassier. Well, I understand that uh, now he is resigning from his position as co-chairman of the Minsk Group, and therefore he is so lucky and comfortable, and he is so nice, he is so uh, generous in uh, spreading different statements to all sides. And being in Yerevan, he says something what comes across and against totally to what he has said to us in Vilnius a week ago, against what ministers Lavrov, Juppé, and Hillary Clinton agreed in Vilnius, totally contrary to what they have put in the declaration, the declaration of Vilnius ministerial uh, meeting on NK conflict. I would go in, de in details of that if time permits, but uh, Bernard, uh, with his uh, usual uh, tricky uh, sentences, uh, went on ex ex explaining to Armenian public in Yerevan that those principles actually are remaining in all versions on the table, uh, saying that there are Madrid 2007 principles, also there are different versions of Madrid 2007, and all of them are on the table. So what a thing Bernard leaves after himself, or is that a way of behavior of throwing back responsibility from his shoulders and whatever happens after me, I don't care. So this is the case uh, of, 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 a, of a ridiculous approach uh, to the issue. I wouldn't say names, but some uh, big bosses coming to Baku after years and years of being responsible for these issues, leaving the office of President Leave, would ask his colleagues, shortly, just brief, uh, just dropping that over the shoulder, give me a file on K. If you come to the region, if you come to see the president, if you come to talk to him, and you dare to take his time for NK conflict, the most important issue of the South Caucasus, which actually matters the whole strategy of the South Caucasus now, couldn't you spend some more time in reading before? and not asking your turtles back on, on your back to give you some files on NK after the meeting. Ridiculous. So this is what should be changed, not the Minsk group format. It's good. It's good beca because we have uh, interested parties there. We have Armenians and Azerbaijanis from Karabakh region comfortably fitting, uh, sh uh, f formed, and uh, put into uh, into the format of the Minsk group, uh, giving them an opportunity to participate there. At the same time, this group is multinational with European and regional powers and players in it. So I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't change also the basis. Uh, there are resolutions of 1993. What a reason to reconsider. 
I wouldn't change principles of Helsinki Final Act, which have been shaped by experience and wisdom of the whole European leadership of 1970s. So the strategy of Azerbaijan is we develop our 80% and we shall make 20 back. Whatever ways for that, uh, it seems to me that Armenia has to reconsider the strategy because from my point of view, even with all difficulty and with all challenge that I take on my shoulders trying to think for them, I, I, would, I would actually consider that as a huge national tragedy when half of population from Armenia is leaving the country, is fleeing from the country for the best uh, sake to, to Russia, West, Europe, elsewhere, doing actually usual Armenian business, migrating. But at the same time, 30,000 Armenians remaining in Karabakh still pretend for something what uh, cannot be considered as serious. So we, in our strategy, uh, supported by some regional countries, supported by the majority of European countries, and supported by majority of UN members, we suggest a very simple solution. Communities will get back to the Karabakh region. They will be guaranteed under international observation. Armenia will be benefiting from economic cooperation if Armenia behaves well. Ticket to the train should be bought. You cannot get on the, tri on the train illegally. And nothing is for free of charge. <laughs> no lunch is free of charge. Uh, then the thing about uh, the uh, position, position of Armenia currently, as I see it, is based on uh, rejecting Azerbaijanis from return to NK area itself. I'm not speaking about surrounding areas, but the return of Azerbaijanis to NK area. For Azerbaijan, this is the only guarantee of a future objective solution of a status. Both communities of NK should be able to participate in this process. And this is not a way uh, acceptable for any European nation to have a fait accompli based solution with mono-ethnic society while, th while the other part is expelled based on that shaping a political decision manipulated through single majority voting by a mono-ethnic society based on fait accompli. This is the thing which uh, I, I see in the position, and I don't see any chances for Azerbaijan to accept it. So return of Azerbaijan is one issue. Second, Armenians under the pretext of corridor taking that as wide as possible try to uh, maintain unilateral exclusive control over the Lachin area. That also, in, in complex, in combination with the previous position on uh, denying, re uh, rejecting return of Azerbaijanis to NK, tells me, with my 22 years experience of this thing, that they, what they have in mind is not any kind of cooperation of Azerbaijanis and Armenians in Karabakh. They have in mind just a uh, separation of this, excluding any possibility for Azerbaijanis and Armenians living and working together in Karabakh, so denying any chance for Azerbaijani central government to exert cultural, economic, and political presence in Karabakh, and at the same time maintaining control over the Lachin area by virtue under the pretext of corridor, uh, trying then to connect Karabakh to Armenia by this de facto fait accompli based development. These are two major issues. There are remaining ones. Remaining are like when Azerbaijanis shall return back, what kind of equality between Azerbaijanis and Armenians will be provided when Armenians reject this equality and they try to insist on current de facto situation there to be recognized as the Euro situation. And also they try to keep territories of Kalbajar and Lachin, as they say, besides corridor areas, uh, non-corridor parts, under 
the hostage control until they figure out what kind of favorable political solution they can get from Azerbaijan. This way, such a strategy will not work. Simply, there will be no solution then to this conflict. And finally, what Armenians are trying to do, they are trying to do to play with us a geopolitical game, like increase, using the uh, matter of security concerns of populations. They try to increase the demand for the presence of enforcement mandated forces, not peacekeeping forces, but enforcement mandate f based forces. And this is a very tricky, tricky game because uh, uh, they realize that uh, the only one way to, to, let's say, to control the situation with strong Azerbaijan economically developing, etc., with population of close to 10 million, while they are shrinking down to I don't know what limits, uh, they would have probably another player coming inside the conflict area and taking a firm position. And that player should not be multilateral. Therefore, OC forces are being dropped. And one of countries opposing the 92-94 decisions of OC summits now is Armenia, strongest and publicly opposing these decisions. And the reason is because they are not interested in multinationality. They are interested in something domestically cooked. I wouldn't go into further details, but I think you understand me. Uh, so this, uh, this f last position, last element, is actually uh, coming, uh, coming not as a total new element. We have been observing these attempts in the past, in 1994, else uh, yet in other years as well. But nowadays, with all these observations in OSCE, I am actually uh, quite, quite tensed about. I think that was a helpful elaboration on the Karabakh issue. Uh, let's take a couple of comments uh, and, then, and then ask Ambassador Zimov to respond. R Ambassador Miles and then Tom DeWall, and then we'll come over this side. Uh, thank you very much. Good to see you here. Um, in Washington, I don't sense a uh, feeling that there is any danger of imminent hostilities uh, over the Nagorno-Karabakh situation, but I must tell you that there is, uh, I sense, an increasing concern over the, the logic of the situation which might lead to such a thing in the future. You, you have an intransigent attitude on the part of the Armenians, uh, especially in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, almost a feeling of cockiness. If hostilities come, you know, we will, we will defeat the Azeri forces. And then in Azerbaijan, you do have continued improvement of the Azerbaijani armed forces. You have superior uh, financial resources, and the military uh, is in a considerably better situation than it was the last time hostilities were involved. So there's a concern over that, and I would just appreciate your comment about that. And then a slightly related question, you mentioned getting the Armenians and the uh, Azeris together in a in a room free of outside influence. I expect that is totally impossible. We've tried virtually everything to bring the two together. And uh, you mentioned the Swedish foreign minister back in my, in my day, and I recall one of the comments she made after a visit to the region, if the two parties are not willing to uh, work this out together, there's very little the international community can do to help them do it. But one power that has not been tried yet to help bring the two of you together in some kind of a forum or discussion format is uh, Iran. Iran had, does have good relations with both uh, Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, and um, it is a regional power, it's more or less disinterested. You could write a whole article about this, of course, including our own relationship with Iran and Russia's relationship with Iran. But I wonder if you've given any thought to the possibility of Iran playing some kind of a positive political role in addition to the economic role which they already play. Let's, let's let uh, Tom DeWall come mm -hmm. in and then, uh, and then respond. Working? Yes, uh, good to see you here. Um, I have a question about the uh, ceasefire violations on, on the line of contact, um, which obviously people are still dying, unfortunately, on the line of contact, and even civilians, as you know, this year, including Azeri civilians. Um, March uh, this year, the three presidents met in Sochi with mid 
President Medvedev, and there was um, a statement about um, setting up a mechanism with Ambassador Kasparchik to investigate these um, ceasefire violations. I believe the State Depart the Minsk Group co-chairs sent some proposals um, this fall to both Presidents Aliyev and Sarkisian, and I, I want to have hear your response to what can be done um, to set up that, that mechanism. Thank you. With pleasure. Well, first of all, on, on the role of Iran. Uh, Iran is, is a neighbor, of course. Uh, we have very uh, uh, different relations with Iran in, in, in many ways. Uh, I would say by one word, they are delicate relations. Uh, our, our assumption is that Iran is uh, quite vigorously economically cooperating with Armenia, having much more agreements with them than with Azerbaijan, and uh, getting them more support in sometimes support which is being used due, due to our knowledge in maintaining the occupation as well. So I wouldn't say that uh, Iran is uh, uh, that good partner in, in settling this conflict. At the same time, if uh, you drop this idea in, then the best format following this logic would be Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and no, uh, no others. Uh, or would the United States come together at the table of negotiations with Iran? Uh, negotiating what? Uh, settlement of their own or their own relations. Uh, seems to me that, uh, in a way, theoretically, this is an idea which we have to keep in mind. But uh, practically, we have a Minsk Group format, uh, which I don't see any reason now to, to change. Uh, with the second question given by Tom, First of all, uh, you, you said line of contact. Indeed, there are some 40 meters in between uh, positions of both parties in some places. In some, there are 800 meters or 700 meters. So soldiers on both sides may wish good night to each other with, with no uh, walkie-talkie communications on that. They will hear each other. Uh, under such circumstances, uh, of course, uh, uh, any kind of uh, normal regime for maintain, maintaining of ceasefire is not applicable. At the same time, while there is no progress in the settlement of conflict, I wouldn't see any opportunity for presence of, uh, of observers or presence of larger number, numbers of uh, forces, because that is a classic model of freezing the situation in the conflict zone, in any conflict zone. Uh, but you know, uh, Thomas, that the, uh, this thing cannot be considered as a substitute to negotiations. And if you get some more increased presences on the line of what you say contact, I would say confrontation, and someone would say ceasefire, and in general this is LOC. So, uh, in, on LOC, you have, uh, for example, some, some tranches, some minefields, some forces on both sides, uh, and there is sporadic violation of ceasefire. Co-chairman tried to contribute, first of all, by inviting parties to withdraw snipers. And that idea was so liked by many who have no idea of what sniper means, actually. Uh, a sniper is an invisible tactical unit. A soldier on his own tactical mission, uh, subordinated to one commander, getting his missions exactly from him and being invisible. So he's not going to violate a ceasefire on a daily basis. As, uh, no need for, sni uh, for keeping snipers for that. On the other hand, I would qualify ceasefires uh, ceasefire violations as uh, sporadic ones, chaotic ones. Withdrawal of snipers, once they are invisible, how can you check it? And how can you trust the other side, say, uh, having, who, which would say that they have withdrawn these snipers? How to implement this, uh, this invitation by the co-chairman? But they have uh, a lot of uh, 
initiatives of this kind. Once Ambassador Kasperchik suggested us to fight rats on both sides of, uh, of, of the LOC, and I just uh, responded, how can I fight Armenian rats? Or if Armenian rats pass through LOC, uh, how can I distinguish Armenian rats from Azerbaijani rats? Which language do they speak? And what is the purpose of providing an, in, uh, an initiative which actually is useless when there is no progress in the settlement? Let's make negotiations. Let's make settlement progress. And uh, ceasefire violations will be dealt with accordingly. Then co-chairman came with a new bright idea on investigation of incidents. Tell me, do you have a measurement of an incident different from a violation of ceasefire? What kind of measurement you may have? Uh, a number of dead or a, m a number of bullets? Kasparczyk many times was on the line when a bullet was just passing uh, above his head. That do does not add uh, to his image of a brave uh, man, but uh, that says another thing. He never dared to say from which direction a bullet came, although he heard it, but he never reported it back. And can you imagine Kasparczyk with his six field officers running through 700 somewhat kilometers long LOC all the day and night, registering and recording all sounds of these bullets, having those incidents to be investigated then. How? So finally, these considerations, uh, unfortunately, taken by co-chairman after the initiative was so propagated, uh, even at the highest level, uh, have recognized uh, actually limited chances for implementation and in Vilnius after long discussions uh, in this ministerial declaration they have put this formula like it's not no more investigation of incidents it's investigation of ceasefire violations and opportunities or possibilities for implementation of this or elaboration of this should be further duly discussed. Uh, so you may understand that in, in a diplomatic language, that means something different. Uh, on the other hand, again, back again to this issue, we cannot accept any uh, increase of observation without any progress in the settlement. We shall be in need for OSCE presence when we have a concluded agreement. If we don't have it, then we cannot adopt anything which will bring further on this situation to refrigerator. Thank you.